Good evening, and welcome to the Desert Institute's uh, monthly program. Uh, our normal host, Gabaccia, will not be here tonight, uh, so I'm going to fill in for her. My name is Kevin Wong. I'm the director of the Desert Institute at Joshua Tree National Park. This program that we do on the second Friday of the month is a partnership between the old schoolhouse in 29 Palms and the Desert Institute. We've been running these lecture series for 17 years, and tonight's program is one of 10 monthly lectures and discussions held on the second Friday. Before we begin, we want to take a moment to respectfully acknowledge the indigenous peoples who have shepherded the land we are now on for time immemorial. We recognize their past, present, and future. And these tribes can include the Mojave, Cahuilla, Serrano, Chemiwevi, and the 29 Palms Band of Mission Indians. Tonight, we're going to have a presentation by Kane West called The Impacts of Early Automobiles and the Mojave Desert. We have a couple of rules that we want to ask everybody to abide by. First, please be nice in the chat. There is a chat a message that you've already been using to say who you are and where you're from. So thank you for doing using it. Kane will take breaks and ask for questions. So go ahead and write your questions in the um, ask a question section, and I will read the questions to Kane uh, when he takes his his little breaks. That way, it's a very interactive evening. In case you get disconnected. Please wait a while, then refresh your browser, and we'll be doing the troubleshooting on our end. If you experience an issue, click on the help button at the top of the chat. If issues persist, drop a comment on the chat so others who may be experiencing the same can also speak up and we become aware of an issue that may be a globally experienced. And um, a replay of this event will be available to everyone who is registered. So with that, I'm going to turn this evening over to Kane West. Kane is a very good friend. Uh, I got to know him when he was living and working in Joshua Tree. Um, he's a wonderful historian, and I know that you're going to have a great time this evening. So Kane, it's all yours. Thank you, Kevin. And uh, it's wonderful to talk to you all. I can't see any of you, any of you so all I'm looking at is my background, and my background looks great, and I'm sure you all look uh, even greater. And uh, Kevin has, uh, he didn't warn you, I don't talk very much, I don't like to talk very much, uh, like, expeditiously, and so Kevin has asked me to make sure that I do fill in the time for this evening, so I will try to be as loquacious as I can. And one of the things before we even get started is that uh, it never gets easier doing presentations online, and but I did have an interview with the Smithsonian, and my background, I didn't know how to change it. It was the screensaver from uh, the Lion King. So I interviewed for a Smithsonian position with the Lion King behind me. So I will never have as bad of a presentation as that. And I did not get that job, as you can imagine. So as we begin tonight, I'm going to take a few seconds, share my screen. What should happen is you will start to see the PowerPoint and then once the PowerPoint starts, I will have a disembodied voice. Am I disembodied? Yes. All right, fantastic. So um, this presentation will mainly cover a, a vehicle history, sort of an automobile history of Joshua Tree National Park from about 1905 to the, the 1930s. And the reason that I'm interested in this is because I have been previously a park ranger at Joshua Tree. I was there for about two years and now I have moved on to the East Coast and I'm at Arlington House, the Robert E. Lee Memorial, which is a very different National Park Service site. And then when I'm not a park ranger, I'm a historian, so I do research and writing and publications. And the, what I discovered is that there is a fundamentally rich history and cultural legacy that we can find in the Mojave Desert. And so what brought me to this particular topic was actually nothing to do with vehicles. It had to do with trying to understand Devil's Garden and the fact that it is 
of something that I hear about that I knew it was important in the park's history, uh, but I didn't know much about it. And so I started to research about Devil's Garden, and on the way I started to realize that there is a, a ton of uh, connections between Devil's Garden and 29 Palms if we look through early automobiles and early car tourism. And so that drew me into this topic, uh, which means that I can't tell you too much about Devil's Garden, I can't tell you too much about 29 Palms, and I can't tell you too much about cars, but I can tell you a little bit about all of them and their connections. And so as we go through, what you'll actually start to notice, hopefully, is that you know, the low desert and the high desert have been connected through this vehicle story for a century at this point, and even more. And uh, just to give you forewarning, when I talk about the high desert, what I'll probably say is 29 Palms, and then I'll say Joshua Tree, and then I'll say the National Park, and then I'll say the National Monument, and all of those are synonyms, and they are all uh, due to me not wanting to repeat the same word over and over again. And the second thing, besides just this vehicle history that tries to connect Devil's Garden and 29 Palms, is uh, that as an amateur historian with the uh, the National Park Service, I am fascinated with tourism history. It's the, tour, it's the history of how we travel. It's also the history of why we travel. And, and that's pretty well established at places like Yellowstone and the Grand Canyon, where you could almost say that those parks would not exist without their tourism uh, industries, like the railroads or vehicles. On the East Coast, we know that uh, the Blue Ridge Parkway and Skyline Drive through Shenandoah and the Appalachian Mountains was specifically created by the Park Service as a vehicle access. And so we can now take that huge story of tourism in the National Park Service and see how it plays out in a place like Joshua Creek. And so I'm excited about that uh, and to see what connections and questions you have as a result. And the reason that you're hearing the feedback right now is because I'm on uh, Kevin's computer and I had him uh, leave the commentary open for me to ask you before we begin your either favorite car memory in the Mojave Desert or the oldest car that you have been in. So favorite car memory or oldest car that you've been in. I don't have any responses yet. Okay, so we have a whole bunch of people who like to walk, which makes sense because they live in L.A. and everybody in L.A. walks. Totally okay, we have one, a 1932 Ford. Ooh, okay, that's pretty cool. All right, and it still ran. That's awesome. And I, I know, I'm not pretending to be a car enthusiast. I don't have, like, posters of old Camaros on my, on my wall. I just know that that sounds cool. How about a 1946 Willis Jeep Ooh. followed by a... A 1961 Mercedes Benz on a dirt on dirt rod or dirt road. 1934 Plymouth and a 1960 DeSoto coming to the monument, and that's okay. in and from Orange County. Thank and you. you have, at least I, I'm so glad to have these references. Hopefully, you'll see some brands that seem somewhat familiar to you, and to the person with the uh, Willis Jeep, you know, that's why we threw this one in here, the most famous car currently located in the National Park. And so, obviously, the Willis Jeep in front of the Desert Queen Ranch. And so, what we'll try to look for tonight is, you know, how um, 29 Palms and also Devil's Garden transformed because of these vehicles from sort of an obstacle to a notable destination and into a national park. How does this transformation happen with these cars? And it actually all takes us back to the very beginning of the automobile industry in Southern California. And what's exciting about the automobile industry in Southern California is that it's essentially the, the automobile industry west of the Mississippi. So when we talk about early LA uh, driving history, we're really talking about early Western driving history. And some of the, the very first uh, production vehicle companies are going to start in 1902. That's the auto vehicle company. They put out about you know, a, a few dozen vehicles a year. By 1905, they're putting out 175 uh, 
cars and maybe about 600 cars total. And they even have a truck line that comes out in 1905. But this Model K tourist runabout by the auto vehicle company was the most popular car in early California. But we have to make sure we understand what that means. These, this is a very niche thing. These are experimental cars. Some of those first cars they were going on in actual tests, six miles an hour. There's only a few thousand of them. It's it's sort of a you know it's the equivalent of people with self-driving cars today. It's just not something that you see much of. But it does exist in Southern California, and it's going to center on LA. So a lot of the the driving history we're talking about connects LA to 29 Palms. And if you want to say that you're from Beverly Hills and therefore LA, we will give you Beverly Hills uh, for the sake of connection here. And at the same time that you have this early history of vehicles in, in LA, there is a connection already to 29 Palms. And as we see on the left hand of the screen, we have uh, the Lost Horse Mine, one of the most successful mines. And it was in proximity to LA. So it's a known mining industry region, you know, great stories, horses that get lost, people that get lost, people that get guns stuck in their face. And the what's important, though, to, to figure out about this mining industry is that it's still very remote. And there needs to be a way to make mining access a little bit quicker. Um, and not only that, but people who are coming back and forth, it will take days for a miner to walk from the 29 Palms mining district down to Banning at the bottom of the hill. It takes three days to make that trip. And so it just takes a lot of time. And then, I mean, think about it. He shaved right before he left, this gentleman in the picture. He grew that beard in three days. And so we're just, it takes a while and, he need, and we need things to move faster. And so with the, it's within that early context of sort of experimental driving that we see the beginning of history of uh, vehicular traffic to 29 Palms. There are no roads. There are just people who are, you know, they, this guy obviously dropped his keys in the dirt and he's looking around. The very first time that we have a successful car trip to 29 Palms is in 1905, late to 1905. And it, and if you look at this center uh, article, it says at the, in the main paragraph, it's one of the most remarkable runabout runs in the annals of local motoring, which means that it is one of the most remarkable runs in the West Coast in general and in the United States. It's happening in 1905, and traveling from L.A. to 29 Palms is a remarkable achievement because what they have done is they have gone up the hill from Whitewater, they crossed the river, they went up the grade, and then they got into Devil's Garden. Sand traps, cactus, rocks. And once you've gone through all of that, you have to go up the entire grade up to Morongo Valley and then up into the basin and all the way to 29 Palms and Gold Park. And the remarkable thing is that on the way back, this intrepid group of three guys is going to achieve the drive back in a day. So they are going to, instead of being a three-day trip, they are one day from Gold Park back to Los Angeles. And it's not just any car that goes. It is the tourist Model K from the auto vehicle company. And what we also should see is what spurs on this action is not tourism. It's not sort of just adventure. It is purely utility. So on that very left-hand side, it talks about it was born of the need of a mining company or transportation and so this is a utilitarian action trying to find the, the latest technological investment. And so we can see that that connection to 29 Palms and those very first car companies, it is there from the very beginning. And not only is it difficult and important for the, real, uh, the, the mining company, the auto vehicle company has now shown that they were the first to get to 29 Palms which means that they have the most durable vehicle. They have the thing that can take you where you need to go. And so it's because of that run that the AVC will be able to promote their brand new truck line. And so when we talk about the beginning and the development of early Southern California uh, vehicle travel, that truck line begins in part from the successful venture to 29 Palms. We now have a vehicle that can conquer the desert.
So already from the beginning, I've proven my point that 29 Palms is very important in early Southern California vehicle history. So we're done with the presentation, we're good. Now, um, that idea that you can talk about desert will immediately be used in really sad uh, ways. Within a few years, you will have uh, a situation in which a young Chimawabi man named Willie Boy, or Willie, will shoot his uh, father-in-law, run off with his beloved into the desert, chased by a posse of men. And that posse will try to find a way that they can outmaneuver a Chimawabi runner in the desert. And they cannot, they do not have the skills to do that. And so they think, here's what we're going to do. We're going to get one of those cars and we're going to load the posse members into the cars. We will go from banning and we will chase him into the desert at 25 miles an hour. So this vehicle that has been proven to help for the mining is now used to do and control uh, indigenous populations. And that vehicle gets about 10 miles out of town and it gets stuck and they have to turn the vehicle around and abandon it and just use the horses. But you can already see these utilitarian ways that car travel is supposed to change the desert. And in this case, control uh, populations of uh, indigenous communities. And so when we think about this car, it's, it's not only something to control the desert, it's also to sort of explore the possibilities of, the, of, of travel. It's trying to shrink space and time. And we can actually see that shrinkage of space and time in the desert uh, through a variety of long distance desert travel. Um, I don't know if any of you would have ever driven from LA to, uh, to Phoenix on the, you know, through all the traffic, but that travel was one of the first ways that early uh, intrepid drivers were trying to promote desert travel. They said, hey, look, we are going from here to there. The roads are terrible and I want you to see how bad they are because we will bring uh, our notoriety to this need to develop better road systems. And these early drivers were some of the most famous in the country. They, would, they were navigators, they would just go off into the desert and just try to make it. And they usually finish this path in about 21 hours, 24 hours, and they would pass through every year different sort of interior desert cities. And so these early drivers were really important for connecting with a lot of those early mining communities. And because they not only were they showing that you could shrink time, they not only were they trying to connect places on the map, they were also trying to figure out the technology. Do we want steam engines? Do we want gasoline engines? And so these early uh, road races about, lasted about six years, but they bring a lot of important uh, momentum to a lot of the early driving roads that we see, like the uh, National Old Road and the Arrowhead Highway are going to come out of these same drivers. 29 Palms is never one of those locations, but driving to 29 Palms is seen as an equivalent feat of endurance, of vehicle endurance. And the reason is because it is hard to get there. This is an image of Devil's Garden in the 19-teens, and it is, again, full of cactus, full of rocks, full of sand traps, and that obstacle means that only the most sort of enterprising motorists are willing and able to try to make it up that grade and through that path. And so people will actually seek out 29 Palms, not as a destination, but to figure out how to deal with the obstacle of the desert. And it'll actually take as long to drive from LA to 29 Palms and back as it would to complete the one-way trip from Los Angeles to Phoenix. So Los Angeles to Phoenix is about 500 miles. It's about 21, 19 hours uh, on a given road race, and the trip from LA to 29 Palms and back is about 300 miles, and it would also take about 21 hours in the 19 teens. And so, but they're going there because of the obstacle that is uh, this, this desert trek. And if any of you remember traveling on highways in the 50s and 60s and having flat tires, at least your flat tire wasn't covered in uh, cactus thorns. So you can see these early drivers through here that are using the automobile, to the devil's guard to test out their automobile. I, I don't know what a Flanders is, but I've heard of a Studebaker, and if I can drive around in a Studebaker in the desert, I would feel pretty cool. 
But you can see that they're using the same promotion of the, the highway development. So vital need for improvement of desert sand section of the highway. And so we can see that 29 Palms and Devil's uh, Garden are, you know, they are obstacles to travel. We need to overcome them. And in one, some of these trips were awful. <laughs> one group is they're going to come down the mountain. It took them an hour and a half to travel through the Devil's Garden area uh, because they were stuck in sand. Their tires got punctured. And uh, I think I need to pause really quick to describe where Devil's Garden is. When you're coming down 10 and then you go to uh, Joshua Tree on 62 and you do the big loop over the 10 and you go across that very windy section, that windy section historically had the largest concentration of cactus, specifically uh, barrel cactus, but most types of cactus uh, anywhere within several hundred miles. It was full of barrel cactus, that was what it was known for, as well as Troya and teddy bear. And so you can just imagine this puncture filled area that today is um, sort of just that straight road that everybody goes 80 miles an hour on on a 65 uh, on super windy days. And so they're, they're, they're seeing this, this place not as a, as a destination that anybody wants to go to, but something that needs to be overcome. And the transformation from th that overcoming won't happen until 1916. And what we start to see is that the perception of travel will change into a tourist destination. And that change into a tourist destination from an obstacle really can be highlighted with a guy named Charles Bigelow in 1916. And Charles Bigelow is the most famous desert driver of his day. He was in those early LA to Phoenix drives. He was in all sorts of short and medium term uh, races. And he would go out as a scout driver to figure out roads that needed to get paved with an all weather road. And in 1916, one of the interior desert towns that he thought should have a, a road like that was 29 Palms. And so he putters up that all that hillside that we all know into the town and he says, you know, this is where we need to go. And he has a vision in mind. He was trying to uh, come up with a new way into Las Vegas from Los Angeles. He didn't want people to go up Cajon Pass, so the current like I-15 route. He wanted people to go from Riverside to Banning to 29 Palms and then north. So the way that we send visitors today is what he was proposing back in 1916. And I also really love the middle picture because I think I can place it. I think this photo is that last steep pitch when you're coming up from Morongo Valley up into Yucca Valley right before you get to the lip. And this is sort of looking back and if it wasn't so fuzzy, you'd probably see San Jacinto uh, behind him. And obviously he's gonna stop at 29 Palms. And so he's going to present this location as, as, a, as an area that needs a road, right? We need to have access here. We can't just have random people driving. We need to have it accessible to the masses. And that is going to change uh, this whole travel into something that's leisure, a leisure travel. And um, much of what we see today, can uh, the way that people drive, can be traced back to this 1916 trip. Now, how do we see that transformation from utility and obstacle into travel? Well, we have wonderful photos from sponsored tours. And so I don't know if anybody's been to the Grand Canyon and gone on a pink Jeep tour, right? So you know that you're in a Jeep or you know that you're in a stretch Hummer limo or you that same idea is happening in the 1920s. We're going to take our car that we're going to promote and we're going to put you in it and we're going to take you to these rugged places that you cannot otherwise go. And some of those early car companies, they would promote these travel as a way to promote their vehicle. And so we can see in the 1920s, early as 1921, you have these sponsored car trips. And I really like the, the uh, Frank Camel trips simply because they and every single photo, they're always parked in front of a very tall uh, barrel cactus. And, you know, somebody thought this is the marketing. 
which is just you know really funny and it gives these uh, wonderfully framed photos and if anybody who's listening has a dog um there are places in the park where you can walk your dog on leash and one of them is in uh, the Oasis of Mara. So this gentleman from 1921, literally 100 years ago, is simply showing you the proper places that you can walk your dog in the park. But you can start to see that you know the roads are still unpaved, um, but there is now access to the 29 Palms Joshua Tree region. And some of the people who go there are even local scientists. So we actually can see the people who will become important in later preservation efforts. They're driving their cars in the 1920s. And what's wild is the way that they're promoting this desert. And I'm going to read you a passage from the LA Times in 1920. They say, to fully appreciate the desert springtime, it is necessary to leave the beaten paths. And in the 29 Palms region, you'll find rock masses, tremendous and imposing, and the tree yucca, the minotaur of the plant world. And so now 29 Palms is being presented as, and Devil's Garden is being presented as, this sort of rugged uh, nether region of the desert. It is no longer an obstacle. It is a place to go if you are one of those intrepid drivers. And what you also see from the, just these pictures alone is this early link between Devil's Garden and 29 Palms as places that you're supposed to see. It wasn't that you just passed through uh, Devil's Garden. You were supposed to stop there in addition to 29 Palms. So we have this link that is going to be extremely important in the way that people understand how to travel through the desert. It sort of becomes a, a collector stamp for tough drivers, right? Not anybody can get up there, just the you know, super tough ones. The group that's the most important though, oh, and I really like this image to see where people stop. Uh, if you look in the upper right, you have a Packard Twin Six, another Cactus Kate, and they're in the Coyote Hole area looking at pictographs. So if anybody's ever been a, in a Packard car, you know, we've got a shout out to you. We have another picture down from Devil's Garden and then, um, the bottom picture is something that the first time I saw it, my jaw dropped. Because if we were all together tonight at the schoolhouse, we would be looking at ourselves in this 1921 image. This picture of, a, of the vehicle coming down into the valley is out of what we call today the north entrance. And, it is, and you can actually see the thin line of the oasis in the distance. So that's looking down into 29 Palms. So these car, you know, these car trips, they, they sort of speak to our own trips today. The most important group, though, for this whole travel, uh, this transition to travel, was the Automobile Club of Southern California. And whether you know it or not, many of you are probably associated with the Automobile Club of Southern California. It is today the most um, well-membered part of the AAA. So somebody uses AAA. I, I'm not endorsing it right now. I just happen to have it. Um, and they, this is one of those early vehicle uh, groups. And they were really important in Southern California development. If you've been to a Southern California state park, if you've been to Sequoia or Redwoods, um, you can thank them. They promoted a lot of those maps. If you've looked at an old driving map, you can thank the Automobile Club of Southern California. Um, and they are going to invest tremendously into early roads. And the reason they do that is they're well-to-do, they're businessmen, they're railroad tycoons, and they wanted to promote tourism in California. And you can see from this image on the right that they are specifically linking Devil's Garden as the gateway to these desert wonders. 29 Palms, White Tanks, Arch Rock, and the Joshua Tree Forest. And their wonderful little map in the middle of it. And so you actually start to see on these driving maps things that are familiar to us today. Devil's Garden, Oasis of Mara, again. And so we cannot understate how critical it is to have this, uh, this driving team promoting a new vision of Joshua Tree. Not as an obstacle, not even as sort of a limited group of rugged, intrepid drivers, but now a place where anybody with a car and some time on the weekend can go to. So we've seen this transformation. I'm going to give us a pause here if we have any questions so far in the lineup. I don't see any yet, Kane. Okay. 
And then I presume everybody is nodding along and they've taken that same photo at Arch Rock. So you can imagine just to, if you look at this photo and you think about those previous pictures of like the Studebaker in the, in the forest, you know, this is no longer a test of the durability and the functionality of your car, right? That's no longer why you would go to 29 Palms. You're not testing anything that's supposed to help you have a whole new driving line of cars. This is now anybody with a car. And the reason that this transformation has happened is because cars have now become extremely widespread. Instead of having, you know, 6,000 cars on the road in 1905, by 1927, you probably have 600,000 cars on the road, and you'll have close to a million by the end of that decade. There will be, you know, a million people, or 600,000 people in Los Angeles. And so you have this remarkable driving culture that has expanded away from being this niche culture into a widespread, um, you know, middle-class endeavor. And so we can see the transformation at Joshua Tree as a sort of an expansion of driving culture in general in Southern California. It's more people are starting to use that. Now, this doesn't happen People don't just go to the desert, though, just because. They go to the desert because they're, in some sense, they're promoted to go to the desert. But something, other cultural changes are happening in Southern California at this time that are going to impact driving, and they're going to then mesh with the park to have this transformation in the volume of people going into the desert. And, um, and so it's... It's not only it's not just a question of is it accessible, right? So we see this automobile club of Southern California member putting in the signs, telling people where to go. You know, they're telling we see the the main framework of the weekend. You're supposed to go to Keys Ranch, uh, Von Batank, Split Rock, Quail Springs, Wonderland of Rocks. These are all very popular places to go to by the late 1920s, which means that the places that people go to today were set in stone as driving locations a century ago and a decade before the park was ever created. But the question is, why are people wanting to go to the desert? And it has to do with a much larger uh, cultural transformation. And if you were to drive through a neighborhood, especially an older neighborhood in Los Angeles today, I bet you that these houses would look familiar and these Familiar houses can give us a clue as to why people are going into the desert in larger and larger numbers. There is a cultural fascination with uh, sort of Spanish revival missions uh, architecture, and a lot of the landscaping has this uh, sort of faux desert appeal. And there's reasons why you have the Spanish revival. It's it's interesting, but and you can ask about that. But the main thing is, if, if you look at the yards, not only do you have the architecture, but it has sort of this desert landscaping, right? Something that's native to Southern California, not native to the coast, but native to Southern California. So people are starting to see uh, the desert as part of like their identity. Something else that's happening: the cactus candy craze, and they, I mean, fantastic marketing. Uh, some of you might have had cactus candy before. Essentially what happens is you go up to uh, the bisnaga, which is not what we would call it today. We would call it a barrel cactus. And you cut open the top of that barrel cactus. And then you take off the top and you scoop out the pulp and you, you know, and it crystallizes. it. You do whatever the confection, uh, confectionerist does and you make it into a candy. And so all of a sudden barrel, ca barrel cactus becomes like a, a food. And today we still have the residuals of that. Some people have actually had candace, cactus candy. I'm from Arkansas. I've never heard of this. That sounds ridiculous. But what I had heard about is that idea of cutting open a cactus and drinking out the liquid, which is also frequently associated with the cactus candy craze. That it's you know the, cact the, the barrel cactus is so it's supposed to feed um, you know human travelers. So people want to have this connection, this actual. Uh, consumption of the desert. 
and the, so that landscaping and this uh, sort of interest in barrel cactus really draws a lot of attention attention to uh, Devil's Garden, and because Devil's Garden is notable for not only the concentration but the grandeur of its barrel cactus. I just want to point out this guy on the right is probably like five eight, five ten, and he is tiny compared to that barrel cactus. There were barrel cactus that were seven feet tall. It was incredible. And they were all over the slopes and they did not appear in that concentration uh, anywhere else in the region. Just a, a remarkable aspect of part of why uh, Devil's Garden is going to become as popular as it does. is because of that sort of floral display and its concentration of barrel cactus. People are also going to drive into the Joshua Tree. They're going to go camping. We even have quotes from Minerva Hoyt. She talks about camping in the Joshua Tree. So you are supposed to drive out. And one of the Joshua Trees that was found near Lancaster was the largest Joshua Tree known in the world. It's about 60 feet tall. It is incredible. I love looking at photos of this Joshua Tree. I mean, it is ginormous. Look at those limbs. It's incredible. And then you have these other... Joshua trees next to it that just don't want to be in the picture because they're embarrassed. They're not nearly as tall. And so this driving culture into the desert, the desert becomes a place where you're supposed to go. And something else that helped the automobile club is that, uh, you know, they were trying to attract attention to the desert, but it had been pretty dry. You know, there hadn't been good springs. They had tried to like to tell people when the flowers are coming out until 1927. And in 1927, it was another one of those, it was one of those springs, one of those springs that you all have hopefully seen when the desert becomes a kaleidoscope of color. And so they drove and so um, they, the automobile club sent scout cars into the desert and they were just contacting everybody. Hey, I'm seeing the spring flowers. They're over here now. No, they're over here. And they would post those into the newspapers and people were just reading the newspapers. Where do I go? When will I see the flowers? And Devil's Garden is full of flowers. And then about you know two weeks later, the Joshua Tree Forest, much higher in elevation, is going to start blooming. And you can even see in this black and white photo that there are that those flowers are on the move. And so you can just imagine the excitement of people who have now had their vehicles and they know where they can go and they know when to go. And so that sort of that structure of tourism uh, marketing is about to work. And people are going to go into the desert by the hundreds. And you can even see, so this reminds me of two years ago, uh, people going to the poppies on the way to the Joshua Tree Forest, and then they stand in the Joshua Trees, and then I yell at them for standing in the Joshua Trees, and then they trample the poppies, and then they put it on Instagram, but there is no Instagram, so instead they send it to the local newspaper, and the newspaper becomes the Instagram of its day. And like any good marketing company, they will use those flowers and those Joshua Trees to sell they're full-size performance luxury sedans. And so anybody who had mentioned the Chrysler that they might have been in, we can see car companies are actually using Joshua Trees to sell their product. And so once again, this new fascination with driving into the desert will spur on the growth and marketing of, of, of vehicles in Southern California. And so by the 1920s, this is your weekend trip. You go to you make it to Morongo Valley by sunset. You wake up early to hit Oasis of Mara by sunrise. White tank, a Vonpa tank that nobody goes to anymore, but unless they think they've found something uh, off the map, but really they're going to a place that people have been going to for a century. Split Rock and then the Wonderland of Rocks. That's your trip in the 1920s. It is the almost the exact same trip that Rangers will send people on today, and that pathway was established well on by the Automobile Club of Southern California. Uh, Southern Cal uh, the, you know, the Automobile Club was not the only people who were excited about this new influx. It's also the potential city of 29 Palms, which loves the tourist traffic, and also, curiously, the city of Riverside. So this is a shout out to the guy from Riverside um, Riverside was very frustrated that San Bernardino was getting all the traffic going up to uh, Los, An Las Vegas, and Riverside promoted a new roadway that would go through 29 Palms because then they would have to go through Riverside and Banning. And so a lot of the 29 Palms Highway uh, 
group was actually founded and established and maintained in Riverside because y'all wanted us to exist so we could get more vehicle traffic. So you're welcome, Riverside. Uh, but a lot of the early development uh, is just really enjoying this, not sort of a shift from mining into tourism uh, and it's into early homesteaders. This is an image of the Campbells driving their car probably over towards their house. They're in a wash. Obviously, there's a smoke tree behind them. And the 29 Palms Inn is going to really enjoy this new travel development. It's going to bring in a whole new influx. Uh, there are other hotels as well. I just like 29 Palms Inn for this image because it's right nearby where we should technically be. Now, so we have this not only the car companies that like people coming in and then this tremendous rainfall, but the city of 29 Palms bec becomes possible because of this influx of vehicle traffic. And almost immediately as all this happens, conservation becomes a primary concern. And we can start to see it in those same newspapers uh, that are promoting travel. And I want you to take a look at this quote from uh, one of those uh, hey, look, this, this is where the wildflowers are. And you can see the motivations of the Automobile Club and of the Garden Club. The Automobile Club advises that plenty of water and supplies be taken on desert trips. The Garden Club of Pasadena urges that the wildflowers be spared so they can be perpetuated for future beauty and enjoyment. So you can see the priorities. One is about travel and access, and the other is about uh, preservation and protection. And uh, just to give you a hint, if your mind is going there, yes, uh, Minerva Hoyt was part of the Garden Club of Pasadena, and so I would presume uh, that she was involved in getting this messaging out and trying to educate. And then some of those early education materials, they would say like, hey, just don't pick too many, right? So they're not trying to offend people by saying don't pick flowers, but don't pick too many. Uh, but something is happening, right? Desert uh, plants are being dug up by the thousands. A lot of times they're being dug up by gold miners. Gold miners would actually get higher. They would dig up a, a cactus while they were doing their prospecting. They would go sell that cactus. Sometimes it was landscapers. Sometimes it was just people who, you know, local gardeners. And so you can imagine that the desert is starting to get denuded by uh, these people who are looking for landscaping projects. So if we look back at that same house from Los Angeles, uh, I just I, this quote, you know, it's something that we don't even think about today, but it seems strange to a newcomer to note that after leaving the deserts and passing through cities and miles of orange orchards, he again encounters cacti in great numbers in Los Angeles. So they're not supposed to be there. Today we have normalized them, but they were transplanted from the desert, right? So you have, uh, and then the place where they would be most interested in, you know, these barrel cactus that, as it says here, are the source of cactus candy, is the Devil's Garden. And so the Devil's Garden becomes the number one site, or the ground zero of needing to conserve, because they are threatened by uh, landscape poachers, by fruit poachers, and also by German desert uh curios. <laughs> People would travel from around the world. They'd seen a lot of spaghetti westerns and they wanted to go see the desert. They would say, I don't care about roses. I want to see cactus. So that's why they flew Lufthansa from Berlin to LA. And probably the most uh, terrifying thing that happened was that some of those motorists burned a Joshua tree. And so I put this quote here because it shows that it was ascribed to motorists. The idiot child goes out with his girl on an automobile ride and sets Joshua trees on fire to see them ablaze. They have a habit of signaling to each other auto parties with these blazing torches. So these, this new access is destroying the desert. And that, in that tree that you see on the right was that ancient 60 foot tall largest Joshua tree in the world that was burned in 1930. And what it did is it spurred conservation to action. It gave the urgency of now for someone like Minerva Hoyt to really be able to transform and gain public attention for her work. And, but the threat was real because every winter and spring, 
if you wanted to go see the Palm Desert, if you wanted to go see the Forbidding uh, Desert, if you wanted to go see Evening at 29 Palms, you are back at it again. And so every single year, the desert, this fragile ecosystem, was further, further, further in limbo because of these increasing uh, desert drivers. And so that's the context in which we see Minerva Hoyt come to the stand. She is trying to educate these drivers. She specifically blames uh, auto tourists, landscapers, people who dig up the, the land and, um, and, and so we can see from her, she is, she is trying to educate uh, automobilists to say, hey, you can't just go and destroy this land. It is fragile and it is beautiful and it needs to stay there. And so her national park tries to answer, the park that she promotes tries to answer that question. It's supposed to be, um, she had been part of a group to identify a lot of fragile ecosystems and that might be set aside as state parks. Uh, Devil's Garden is one of them. The Joshua Tree Forest around Keys Ranch is one of them. And so if we see this image, you can see that she is able to put the line around the Wonderland of Rocks all the way into the transition to Cottonwood Spring in the Colorado Desert. But she is not able to have the, uh, the boundaries extended to Devil's Garden, which is over by the what's 29 Palms Junction. And so she tries her best, uh, but she does not succeed to, uh, to protect all of those desert landscapes as she might have wished. And so what's bizarre in some sense is if, as, as we look at who is promoting the national parks, not just Minerva Hoyt and the National Monument, it's those same car companies. So by the mid 1930s, those car companies that had just sort of had wanton travel and access are now saying, hey, well, we have a national park in our backyard. And, uh, you know, here's us traveling through and, you know, we're promoting going to the palm trees again, going to the rocks, seeing the Joshua trees, all those aspects of the park. But now you have the, uh, the purveyors of just access are now supporting the parks. And I do want to point out, if you look in that outdoor section, so it's LA Times, outdoor section, the very first thing that is outdoors is automobiles. It's not hiking, camping. It is vehicular access. And so we can just tell how ingrained um, automobile culture is to accessing these places and going camping. And so it just becomes this ironic, but also very um, familiar connection between the national parks and driving culture. Now, uh, we might think of this as being really disturbing to locals, but it's not. In fact, everyone's favorite uh, cowboy loves having visitors. And so essentially what has happened is Minerva Hoyt has told everyone that the desert is a place worth protecting and uh, local inhabitants see uh, the roads and these travelers and the Joshua trees as a place worth promoting. And no one promotes better, no one promotes themselves better than Bill Keyes. And in some, case, some ways, Bill Keyes benefits from this new travel. And the reason I say that is if you look in the early newspapers, Bill Keyes is sort of this strange guy. He's a known gunman. People avoid Bill Keyes. Having travelers come to Bill Keyes with whom he can tell all of his favorite shootout stories makes Bill Keyes sort of a, a quirky but lovable desert uh, character. And he would actually he would act out the shootings uh, from his older days. He would tell people about all of his mining adventures. You know, known gunman uh, becomes everybody's favorite grandpa rancher. And so he's actually able to promote himself. And so people will stop at his ranch. They'll have the pears. They'll have the apples. And pretty soon in the 1930s, he becomes essentially a subcontractor for a lot of hotels in Palm <laughs> Springs in order for those. Uh, and people would come to have lunch and fried chicken at his ranch before going to Keysview, before going back to Palm Springs. 
And so this is a very happy Bill Keys, and he is very glad to have visitors who want to have their Wild West experience riding horses and tipping their caps like John Wayne. And we know this because he tells people this. We know he's excited about visitors because he tells people this. In the 1930s, he already sees the Keys Ranch Dam, not Barker Dam, but Keys Ranch Dam, as the centerpiece of being able to sell a mountain desert resort. So this is a guy who says, we're going to have hundreds of vehicles driving through here. Sign me up. My property just got a lot more uh, valuable. The city of 29 Palms, also very excited. You now have, by the late 1930s, this thing that had once been one of the toughest locations to get to is now, 30 years later, uh, accessible by hard top road. And 1937, the, the paving that goes through uh, Devil's Garden, through the Morongo Basin, into 29 Palms, they literally have a parade. And representatives from the Automobile Club of Southern California are at the front of the parade. And I actually, so again, we see the, um, and you, you can see here the sirens. Those sirens are setting up for us doing a reenactment of that parade. So you can see that same view on the left hand screen going back down into Morongo Basin, that last part of the trip up to Yucca Valley. And on the right hand screen, you're basically looking at the like the Valero station in 29 Palm or in Joshua Tree. And that I, I, I'm, my guess is that that's the road that goes up into the west entrance of the park today. And vehicle access would have been extremely exciting for these people promoting having vehicle access. The only problem is what you've now done is you've now made it extremely easy for hundreds of thousands of Southern California drivers to make it into their national park. And you've made the trip through Devil's Garden accessible with almost zero hindrances. And whereas the park becomes more accessible, we see the damage in the Devil's Garden. And it's kind of hard to show that through pictures. So what I'm gonna show you in the next slide is the legacy of vehicle access through different statements over time about Devil's Garden. Uh, on the, I'm just gonna frame this picture. On the right-hand side is a picture from uh, Palm Springs in the 1950s, telling people where they're supposed to drive to. And you can see on the north part of it, you can go to 29 Palms, you can go to Morongo Valley, but there really is no Devil's Garden, even though for so long it had been the premier wildflower cactus viewing spot in Southern California. And just listen to these change over time. In 1939, they talk, they're already mentioning that things are starting to miss, go missing. You know, it had been a jungle. It's uh, no longer a jungle, but it's still pretty unique. Uh, but, but that's all due to vandalism. 27 years later, on older maps of this area, there is a spotlight north and west of Desert Hot Springs with the notation, the Devil's Garden. It's already becoming obscure. People don't inherently know about Devil's Garden just within a 30-year time frame. And then 20 years after that, Cactive thieves have been active west of Highway 62 in an area known as Devil's Garden. Devil's Garden had previously been one of the most famous locations to travel to in all of Southern California. It was the center spot for uh, barrel cactus. And now, 60 years, 50 years after that, it is a place known as, formerly remembered as. And so we can actually see in this notation uh, that basically within the last 40 years, 50 years, Devil's Garden has essentially um, lost its splendor in part because of uh, vandalism and extrication of all those cactus. So we're still left with this, this legacy that now we can sort of see in different frameworks. And I know people love to see these old cars in the park. I usually just assume that it's a car that Bill Keys got and they just parked it there and then took the wheels off or something. Um, but they also, they show us that transformation. Like we don't know why these cars originally arrived 
They might have been for the utility of mining. Maybe they came a little bit later when, when it was an obstacle and needed to show how tough their car was. Uh, then it became a place where you know, those in, first intrepid drivers, there was a badge of achievement, like there's a collector stamp that they were able to drive in the desert. Then it becomes a place where sort of everyone can go to, right? You're supposed to go and enjoy the Southern California desert. That is part of your birthright as a Southern Californian. And then this becomes a national monument because there is such an urgency to protect the desert that we must set it aside as one of the great protected places in the country. So you can see these cars coming in at different generations that we all think we see, we see historically as flattened, but it's different people at different times coming into the desert for different reasons. And I also like these cars because they're like relationships. Right? We can see that the, these cars are a link between Devil's Garden and 29 Palms, between 29 Palms and Los Angeles. Between, Los Ange between 29 Palms and Southern California driving culture, between 29 Palms and the national park history of vehicle travel into the desert. And so when we look at these cars, we can see that uh, they're just Americans before us trying to figure out their relationship with the natural world, trying to get into the wild. Right? They're, they're seeking out, they were seeking out something. And so today, you know, I really love this image. We have nighttime coming out of the, the, the northern, uh, the north entrance. Uh, people coming in, they, they've timed their trip to include that perfect view of sunset that always happens with the, the pink the kiss of the sun on the, on the clouds. And sometimes it's annoying uh, to be there late in the afternoon, check people's passes. But in some sense, they, they're there they're there for a reason. They, you know, they came out to the desert because they were told that they would find something here. And they're not the first people to come out to the desert and drive that exact same path searching for something. Right? The image of Cactus Kate coming out of the north entrance, looking down into the 29 Palms. And if you hit that at sunset, your world explodes in the splendor of this place that we're all called to, this Mojave Desert that is full of wonder. And so I think about each one of these people, they are all called for that same reason. Yes, there's more of them, but they're searching for something. They've been told that they can find something, that they have a, a different answer. Um, and they're just following the same patterns of a century of Americans discovering the splendors of the desert. So I, I send you all off with the fact that we're still searching, we're still look, looking for those relationships. And I wanna thank you all for your love of the parks and your willingness to listen to this vehicle history that connects us all to this amazing place. Thank you, Kane. Um, what a wonderful presentation. Does anybody have any questions that they want to ask of this gentleman? Feel free to um, ask any questions. I get a lot of uh, chats saying, fantastic, job well done. Thank you. That was awesome. Fantastic. Thank you, Kane. Um, so why don't we all give him a virtual round of applause? We can't be seen doing it, but you know, let's give it a try. Um, so the next program that we have coming up will be on Friday, May the 14th at 7 p.m. We will join botanist Robin Kabali and her on her talk of her book called The Desert Underground. She will take you on a graphic virtual tour of the hidden but magnificent world under the surface of desert soils. Robin's a wonderful friend and a great naturalist and biologist, and you'll have a great time with her. So we'll look forward to seeing you again next month on Friday, the second Friday of every month on May the 14th. So until then, I'm going to sign off and everybody wants to say thank you very much, Kane, for the wonderful job. And by the way, Kane is currently 
seeing us from Washington, D.C., where he now lives and works. So thank you very much, Kane, and we'll sign off.